All right, we've got our lab seven problem set up. We've got four problems. You only have to do two problems. If you do all four, then you'll get two of them for bonus points. The first problem is to explain the concept of main effects and interactions with an example using R. Now I made this one for you mainly, so I'm not going to give you a full solution video on this one. I think it would be helpful for you to try to do this um, and it will improve your understanding of main effects and interactions by trying to explain those concepts to somebody else. And uh, you can see some examples of me trying to do that if you read chapters uh, 10 and 9 from my stats textbook. I'm going to quickly do kind of half of this uh, using the iPad. I have, I'm not going to use an R example, but I'm going to quickly talk about main effects and interactions um, with this whiteboard as an example to get you to start thinking about this stuff. So I'm imagining something kind of silly. This is just a graph where we're measuring mean walking speed. So imagine you go around and you measure how fast people walk on average. Now we're thinking about manipulations that might change how fast people walk on average. And what I have up here is a coffee manipulation. And what I'm going to say is we've got a group of people and they drink zero coffees and they don't have any caffeine in their system. And we've got another group of people and we make them drink two coffees. So they got more caffeine in the system and they may be more awake. Now let's think about what this manipulation might do. And let's hypothesize that the more awake and more caffeine you are uh, have in your system, the faster you'll, you'll walk a bit because it's, you know, it kind of makes it easier to walk faster. So when we don't really do anything, this is like a control condition. We imagine that how fast people will walk is basically the same as on average, how fast they walk just normally, you know, we haven't done anything. So we expect the average. What I've got here is our grand mean. If we kind of knew what this would be, uh, we would expect this to be the mean of the population of walking speeds. So for this condition, we're predicting the mean of people who drink zero coffees. Um, they're going to have a mean right around the grand mean, right? Um, or the sort of the population mean, maybe I should say that. Let's call this the, the population mean. So if our coffee manipulation is, uh, is effective, then we expect it to do something to the walking speed of the people in that group. What I've drawn here is a decrease in the mean. So let's say this is faster as the numbers go down, you faster walking speeds. And as the numbers go up, you got slower walking speeds. So I'm representing this idea that the coffee manipulation, as you increase the number of coffees, you increase the mean walking speed. We call this a main effect. This is the main effect of drinking coffees. More coffees, faster walking speed. And by the way, this is just a fake example. I don't know if drinking coffee makes you walk faster. But for the purposes of this example, we are just using this uh, as a situation where manipulation could cause a difference between the levels of an independent variable. And here we've got two levels, zero coffees and two levels. And if we wanted to have another one, we could say, well, what about one coffee, right? We could have three levels if we wanted. All right, let's think about a second independent variable, something else we could manipulate here independently to the number of coffees that you're drinking. I've already written down regular shoes in blue. What I'm imagining is that uh, when people ran this experiment and drank zero, one or two coffees, they'd be wearing their regular shoes. And so we'd be measuring how fast they're walking when they're wearing those regular shoes. And I was thinking about shoes because, you know, if we manipulated the shoes that people were wearing, I think that would also change how fast they walk. For example, I'm thinking we could have a second condition. I'll put it down here in red. 
I'm not sure if this is really a thing, but heavy shoes. I, we could make really heavy shoes and put people in those heavy shoes, and guess what? You'd walk slower because it'd be harder to move your legs, right? And so what would happen to these three numbers here? This number, this number, and that number. Well, we could have a entire new groups of people who drink zero coffees, one coffee, and two coffees. And it, instead of wearing regular shoes, they're going to wear heavy shoes. And let's think about where would, where would we draw these red dots? Does this red dot go, where, where does it go? I mean, I'm going to say that if you drink zero coffees and you're wearing really heavy shoes, you're going to be walking slower than you would if you were wearing your regular shoes. So I'm going to put that red dot up there. All right, because wearing heavy shoes slows you down by how much is this? By about that much in my example. And I'm going to say that's how much it slows you down you know, every time. So if, if you've gone over here and you've drank one coffee, you're a bit faster because you're drinking one coffee, but you're still wearing those heavy shoes. So, you know, the, if you're wearing heavy shoes, you'd probably have a mean around here. And if you drank two coffees, yeah, you'd be faster, but overall slower. So you, we might expect data that looks something like this in this two by two, or this is a, th sorry, this is a, a two by three experiment. Um, let's make it a two by two by just deleting this middle thing. So now we've got two independent variables, two levels. And what I want to talk about here is the concept of main effects. The main effect of coffee, if we were to visualize that, I'm going to make this a little bit easier to see. And delete this stuff. So we've got four different means because we have a two by two design. Sometimes we make a little table like this, and we can. Th I'm just going to say C for coffee, one and two, or that's because it's zero coffees and two, and S for shoes, and we've got R and H. So we've got some people right here. Um, this one. That's the combination of zero coffees and regular shoes, right? And uh, this one's the combination of zero coffees and heavy shoes, and so on. There's four different cells, four different conditions. Um, all right, let's ask about the question. The main effect of coffee here that is these, oops, dun dun, that one. We're asking about all the data here, that is versus all the data here. Now, that might look a little messy. We're talking about the average of these things, which is kind of in the middle around there, versus the average of those things around there, right? So if we want to know what the main effect of drinking coffee is on walking speed, formally we're asking about the difference between this value and this value in terms of walking speed. So I'm just going to make a little line across here like that. And I'm going to say, see the difference here, this difference. The size of that difference is the main effect of drinking coffee. Um, let's do the main effects of, of wearing shoes here. So this is a different main effect. And now we're talking about thinking about the average effect of wearing regular shoes averaging over the coffees and the average effect of wearing heavy shoes averaging over the coffees. So how do we perform those averages? 
Well, what's the average of the regular shoes? We've got to average these two things together and compare it to the average of those two things. So if we were to do that, I mean, a quick way to do that with the lines is to think the average between these two dots is right in the middle, right? The average between these two dots is right in the middle of those two dots. So um, the main effect of the wearing shoes manipulation is between whoops, those two, those two averages. Okay. So the final thing here is the concept of an interaction. What I'm showing you uh, displays two main effects and no interaction. I mean, let's say, for example, that drinking coffee doesn't do anything to how fast you walk. So um, what would we find in this experiment? Let's think about what you might find if you were wearing regular shoes. You might find something like this. A straight line there, no difference between walking speed between zero and two because do, drinking coffee doesn't do anything to how fast you walk. Well, what would happen if you're wearing heavy shoes here? You'd still be slower, right? Because there's a main effect of the kind of shoes you're wearing and no main effect of coffee. So that's what we've drawn here. Um, let's say there was an effect of coffee, but there was not an effect of shoes. I mean, the way we have it set up, I think it's hard to think that we've got these heavy shoes. Let's just change that and say we've got blue shoes, blue shoes and red shoes. So I don't think the color of your shoes, and let, let's say we did, didn't tell people what color their shoes were. We forced them to wear these different shoes and we put blindfolds on them, I don't know. <laughs> let's say people don't know that their shoes are different. So what's gonna happen in this experiment maybe is that drinking coffee is going to change how fast you walk, but the kind of shoes you're wearing won't change how fast you walk. So what would that look like? maybe we would see something like this. When you're wearing blue shoes and you drink zero coffees, you're kind of in the middle. And when you drink two coffees, you're faster. And what about when you are wearing red shoes? Well, that would basically be the same thing. The dots would overlap because there'd be no difference between your shoes. And so you get something like this. Here you can clearly see the main effect of coffee and uh, you can't see, because the lines aren't separated, you can't see a main effect of wearing shoes, of, of wearing different kinds of shoes. Um, so that's the presence or the absence of a main effect in this line graph here. The final thing is an interaction. And I haven't drawn any interactions yet. An interaction occurs when the effect of an independent variable changes across the levels of the other independent variable. And a lot of times you, you know, depending on the independent variables, you might not expect or predict an interaction. Like in this case, we've got uh, something kind of sensible. Um, let's imagine that drinking coffee makes you walk a little faster and that the color of your shoes, you know, doesn't really do anything. So we could pretend there's going to be an interaction and it's going to be a bit of a weird stretch, but um, consider a universe where for some reason, um, let's draw this again here. So when you wear blue shoes, you walk a normal speed 
when you drink zero coffees. And when you drink two coffees, you walk a faster speed. And with red shoes, when you drink zero coffees, there's no difference. Now, previously, we said when you drink two coffees, there's you know, no effect of the color of your shoes on how fast you walk. But let's just say, in this strange universe, when you drink two coffees and you wear red shoes, something else happens that's different. So, for example, maybe like this. People who drink two coffees and wear red shoes walk really slow for some unknown reason. So here, the effect of drinking coffee makes you faster when you're wearing blue shoes and makes you slower when you're wearing red shoes. That's ridiculous, but uh, it's an interaction and it's an example of an interaction. What it's showing us is that the effect of the coffee manipulation changes as a function of the levels of the other independent variable. So the, when, we, when we look at the blue level of the shoe independent variable, the effect of coffee goes down like this. And when we look at the red level, it goes up like that. So the effect of coffee changes as a function of the levels of the other independent variable. Okay, that was much longer than I wanted to do, but that is an iPad whiteboard kind of walkthrough of some of the things that are going on with an interaction. And we'll, we'll go over this in many other ways throughout the rest of the course. So let me get on to the next one. All right, so here we have complete the two by two factorial lab found right here. If we grab this, head over to the browser, pop that in, what you can see is there's um, a whole lab here that's from the undergraduate version of this course that I teach sometimes that gives you an example of loading up some data. It explains the study design here. It's a Stroop effect, which you might be familiar with. We load the data in, it's a two by two design. Actually, this design is a two by two repeated measures design, which we haven't yet discussed in class. And um, however, in this lab exercise, we show you how to pretend that it's a between subjects design, run it uh, Nova for a between subjects design, and also run the correct Nova for the repeated measures. But I'm just scrolling through showing you that what I'm asking you to do is going up to 10.4.8.1, right up to here, uh, to get to the point where you could uh, write a little uh, results section for this example data. So this lab provides all the instructions you'll need to do this. I think we can do it pretty quickly. Let's see if that's true. So let's go to the top of this and see what we need to get. The example data for this should be already available to you, um, but we could try grabbing it this way too. So let's load the data this way. So library, data table. All right, in terms of getting the data here, first of all, if you click this link in your browser, you could grab this. You could just copy and paste it into a text file, turn it into a CSV file, and put it into your project directory. Two, uh, you could use, uh, let me say, I have to find it one second. All right, sorry. If you go to lab two from the first semester, so lab two descriptives, and remember, there's a zip file. We downloaded a bunch of open data files. So we have to scroll down here. And it's here somewhere. Here it is. There's the link. Download this zip file. And that zip file contains a bunch of open data files. What you want to do is find the stroop underscore stand.csv file. 
in order to continue with this example. So I've got that right here, and I'm loading it in with the fread function. Here's the data. Should be able to tell right away that it's in wide format. We're going to have to turn it into long format, and let's do that. Run the ANOVA. Okay, so what else do we have to do here? We can copy this code. What this does is lab, sorry, lab seven. Uh, this is one way in which we can create a long data frame kind of doing it by hand. So we're basically just taking the reaction times and making them into one long column and then creating the appropriate columns for the congruency variable and the posture variable. Um, and I can just briefly say, this is a Stroop experiment where we have congruent and incongruent items that people have to read. So for example, here you have to say, the name of the ink color, red, green, blue, and yellow. And notice that's the same as the word here. So sometimes you'll be presented these items and sometimes you'll be presented these incongruent items. You have to say blue, yellow, red, green here. And notice the word mismatches the ink color. So people are looking at these and saying the ink colors and typically are faster for these ones and slower for those ones. And that produces what's called the Stroop effect, main effect of congruency. And in this experiment, some subjects sat in a chair like me right now and did this experiment. And some subjects stood up and did the experiment. And the question was, would the size of the Stroop effect change depending on whether you were sitting or standing? So that's your two independent variables, congruency and sitting versus standing. All right. So at the end of the day here, we put all these things together, make a Stroop data frame just like this. And we can now go ahead and do the ANOVA. We're gonna scroll down and find that part. If you wanted to take a look at making this graph, we could do that too. Should be able to just copy all this code in run a graph. All right, okay, so it looks like that code needs tidy R, Stroop long. Uh, I think I was making some changes here. I see. Well, just to be complete, we can, uh, what's going on in this part of the lab is just a different example of converting from a wide format to a long format. So we already did that up here, but we can do it again using this other way of doing it. Whoa. Oh, this is kind of annoying right now, sorry. All right, I copied in that code here. So this little bits and pieces, they produce a data frame like this one. Um, again, another way of doing a long uh, con conversion to a long format. So I think with that in hand, we should be able to make our ggplot. And just to quickly interpret this graph, We've talked about the congruent and the incongruent conditions, and people are typically faster for the congruent condition compared to the incongruent condition. So we can see that here. Here's mean reaction times. These are faster ones in the red bars. These are slower ones in the turquoise bars. Um, so when people were sitting down, the difference between these bars was about that big. Hard to say how big that is exactly. It's 
looks like it's around 110 milliseconds or something. So not a huge difference, but it's a, that's about how big Stroop effects are sometimes. And that's pretty common finding actually. So people are faster when the ink color and the word match. And they're slower when they mismatch. Well, what happened when the subjects were standing up? It looks like that size of that difference got a little bit smaller. Uh, if you can see the difference between the red and the turquoise, a little bit smaller. And this would be an example of an interaction pattern where the Stroop effect changes as a function of the levels of the other independent variable. So it's a little bit larger when people are sitting, a little bit smaller when people are standing. All right. So we've made the plot. Let's grab this ANOVA table. We want to run the ANOVA. I guess I'll just add a little piece of code here. So our, we're going to use the Stroop long table. RTs is the name of our dependent variable. We've got congruency and posture as the other two independent variables. So that's what our ANOVA form, formula is going to look like. So we can just run this, run the summary. Uh, I guess I didn't print it out there, but I could do that. And there you go. Now we're looking at the main effect of the variable congruency. So they reported a significant effect in the paper, and we're seeing that here. And here's the main effect of posture. So that would be on average whether sitting or standing made, made you faster or slower. And then the congruency by posture interaction. This is a way of asking if the size of the congruency effect changes as a function of whether you're sitting or standing. And just as a side note, so right here I'm saying, or the ANOVA is showing that the, val the p-value is 0.48, and um, this wouldn't can, you know, constitute a rejection of the null hypothesis. However, if you were to continue on with this lab and change the ANOVA to a repeated measures ANOVA, which is actually what the design was. Um, you'll see that changes the situation somewhat. Our purpose here was just to um, go through some of the motions of getting some data into R and running a factorial ANOVA. So if you want to follow through, uh, you can take a look at the steps for the ANOVA write-up and those uh, and try uh, well, copy this example right up you know take a look at how I'm writing it up and um, we'll talk more about these steps in the next lab so that's problem number two all right let's look at problem number three and so to do that I'll go grab this link, pop it in here, and what problem number three is is saying go to this website, scroll down, and take a look at these figures. So what these figures are doing, uh, let's look at the line graphs, it's a little nicer to look at. These figures are showing some different patterns, general patterns that can occur when you have two independent variables and a factorial design. And I'm just going to briefly explain what this graph is talking about. Um, so right up here, we are trying to depict a situation where there is no main effect of the first independent variable, no main effect of the second independent variable, and no interaction. So all of the means are the same. And I've got that. Um, so here is level A and B of independent variable 1. So things on the left are in level A, things on the right are in level B, and uh, independent variable 2 is described by the different colors and different lines. And you can see that the values in A and B are the same, and you, 
the values in green and red are the same and we can't even see the red one it's behind the green one they're just totally perfectly on top of each other let's talk about this graph just for fun here we're depicting no main effect of independent variable one i've got the tilde to in indicate none so again independent variable one is represented as the left side versus the right side if you were to look at the average of the values on the left side they'd be around here right and the values on the right side would be around here and you can you can see that the lines are parallel so there's no difference between a and b on average however so that there is no main effect for the a b uh, manipulation however there is a main effect for the second independent variable that's red versus turquoise so here the lines are definitely shifted up and down um, there's a difference between this level and this level of independent variable two and it's saying no interaction so the size of the difference doesn't of, of one independent variable doesn't depend on the levels of the other independent variable. So for example, the difference between red and turquoise doesn't change depending on whether you're in group A or B, right? If you're in group A, the difference between red and turquoise is the same size as the difference between red and turquoise in group B. So there's no interaction here. Let's jump over one more. Slightly different situation. Again, no main effect for the first independent variable. The differences between A and B are the same. Now just pause for a second. On average, what is the value for A here? Well, that's gonna be the average between turquoise and red. It's right in the middle. What's the average in B between green and red? Also in the middle, and can you tell that there is no difference between A and B. You have to do a bit of visual averaging to see that. So there's no main effect for the AB independent variable one. There continues to be a main effect for independent variable two here, right? Red is definitely different than turquoise. They're completely different. <laughs> the average of red would be right around in the middle here versus the average of green. So that difference represents the main effect of the red versus green manipulation. Finally, there is an interaction. So this is representing the interaction between the independent variable one and the independent variable two. We can see that because the difference between the red and the green bars in condition A is much larger than the difference between the red and green bars in condition B. So if we were to uh, talk about the main effect of independent variable two changes across the levels of independent variable one. All right, so I just walked through um, three panels here uh, just to talk about all eight panels i will scroll up a little bit and just say that in a simple case of a design with two independent variables there's eight basic things that could happen you could have no effects of any of those three things no independent no, nothing for IV1, nothing for IV2, and no interaction. A totally null result on all three. You could have a main effect of the first independent variable, but none for the second and no interaction. So all these things are independent, so they can all be on or off independently. So there's all the combinations, and there's eight of them. So you, you can have a main effect for independent variable one, none for independent variable two, and a positive, uh, and an interaction, a presence of an interaction. 
Okay, you can have a presence of a main effect for one, for independent variable two, and no interaction. You can have all three. You can have an independent variable one main effect, an independent variable two main effect, and an interaction. And finally, you can have these other three ones here. So I tried to be exhaustive. And then I made a bar plot giving examples and of um, these patterns for each of these eight different things. And this is, a, I think, an, a useful exercise to think about the different ways that you could get a main effect or not um, for each of the main effects and get an interaction or not. And so my challenge to you is reproduce this graph. How would you make this graph? So I'm going to show you how I did it, and I'll show you a fast way to complete this assignment. But uh, it's useful to think about this graph. It could help you understand the ways in which these patterns could occur in real data. All right, if you want to see how I made these graphs, because if you could tell they're made in R, you could head over to my GitHub uh, account, Crump Lab. Go find the statistics textbook right here, statistics. Now this is the source code for the textbook. So you could go to the 10th chapter. And here's the R markdown I used to make the chapter. So if you want to know how I made that plot, here's the bar plot. So we should be able to just copy all of this. And this would be one way to do it. Let's press play, see if it works. Cool. So um, that is one way, you know, check out that code, see if it makes sense to you. I'll note that there's lots of different numbers you could put in here that would still be true. It would still show, like for example, these numbers, <laughs> they're intended to show no main effect uh, for the first independent variable, none for the second, and no interaction. Well, I mean, we could put six, 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 and six there, and there would still be no main effects interactions. Uh, we'd just be raising the grand mean here. Um, you know, so there's lots of ways that we could, you know, well, let's think about this third one for a second. Um, okay, so we're seeing that there's this is in, there's no tilde on the two the two represents independent variable two which is the red green contrast we can see the red bars are lower than the green bars so there's a main effect there between red versus green no interaction no main effect for the first independent variable wow i could make this graph look very different and the exact same general pattern will be true just a main effect for independent variable two. So let, let's do that. Um, and which one was that? That's the third one. I think one, two, three, this one here. So here we go. And 10, 13, five, two. Oh, is this, is this right? <laughs> P one two three, so this is this. ten. No, that doesn't seem right to me. Hmm. Curious. I'm now trying to figure out what I was doing. Maybe I should quickly. What does this do? All twenty twos. Okay. Type. This is the data frame if we were to inspect it. Yeah, this these numbers look uh, uh, no. Nope. Um 
Oh, it's, the, it's this one right here. 510, 510. No main effect for one. There is a main effect for two. And not, no interaction. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ah, this is the title I was looking for. Oh, sorry. Oh, man. Wow. <laughs> Here we go. This one. One, two, three, four, five, six. I could have, I think I could have made my code much easier to figure out. Wow. So it's the sixth one right here. If we change the values in this one, we will change that one we were looking at. I was uh, talking, so let's make this look very different than it did before. And I, I feel like we need a little reminder about what was going on. So here's what we're doing. And just, and by the way, we've already solved the problem. You can always just take a look at this code. I was gonna try to change this panel right here to make the main effect very different looking, even though it's still a main effect for independent variable too. Um, now one way I could do that, I think, is have the red bars be bigger than the green bars. So let's, let's do that. Let's make this a 10. Let's make that a 2. And let's make this a 10. And let's make that a 2. So this graph looks very different now, but the fundamental pattern is still there. There is no main effect for the first independent variable. When you look at the mean for A, that's the mean that collapses over these two bars. So that would be in the middle here. As, as you can tell, the bars in A uh, are both the exact same as the bars in B. So if we averaged them in A, we get a number, and we average them in B, we get a number. We get the same number. There'd be no difference, so um, there would be no main effect for A versus B. But uh, clearly there's a difference between the red bars and the green bars. So there's a main effect of the second independent variable. And again, there's, there's no interaction here, right? The size of the difference between the red and the green bars is the same in the A condition as it is in the B condition. So the size of this effect doesn't change across the levels of the other independent variable, no interaction. My point there is there's lots of ways we could change the numbers because the, the actual pattern of the numbers, uh, the actual pattern of the means can be very different um, as well. So this graph uh, helps you understand that there's a variety of patterns that can be encountered here in terms of whether or not you have an effect, main effects, interactions. Um, you can have any one of them be there or not there. Uh, and the actual pattern that you'll find can be, can be different. So you need to develop the skill of being able to see whether there is a main effect or not and also be able to interpret what the pattern is um, using words that describe, you know, the direction or the trend. So we'll be working on doing that as well in other classes. If you wanted to make the line graph version, you could go back here and uh, copy this, which turns this graph into a line graph. There you go. All right, question number four. In the concept section in the lab, we found that the factorial ANOVA doesn't control for family-wise type one error rate. Um, with a two by two design, we had three independent F tests, the main effect for AB and the AB interaction. And we found that if we ran an experiment 10,000 times and considered any one of those three things to be significant, and we had an alpha of 0.05, uh, 
we were getting around 14% of our experiments to be, um, you know, significant, making a type one error. So let's uh, figure out this question. So use an R simulation to find the family-wise type one error rate for a factorial design with three independent variables. All right, we'll do it the easy way based on the lab. And let me quickly find the code we need for that. Oh, I would just do it like this. R binome, I'm gonna do 10,000 experiments. Now I happen to know when you've got three independent variables, we're gonna have A, B, C, three different main effects. We're gonna have the A by B, A by C, and the B by C two-way interactions. And we're going to have the total three-way interaction here. So that's seven different independent tests. We could use our R binome function, set the size to seven, and set the probability of making a success, which would be a type one error here, to be 0.05. And run this 10,000 times. So there we have it. Uh, well, I guess we don't have it. There we go. Now we have seven, or I'm sorry, 10,000 simulations. Let's ask the question, how many of these are greater than zero? These are all the ones that are greater than zero. These are simulations where one of the seven made a type one error. In this experiment, there are seven tests, so the ANOVA, one of them made a type one error. How many of the 10,000 are greater than zero? 3,000. So if we want the proportion, oh sorry, divide by 10,000 here. So 30%, if you run an experiment with three, three independent variables and you consider any of the seven uh, F tests to be significant and you'll reject the null, you'll make a type one error 30% of the time, roughly. So that's something. I think we talked in class and we can just do this real quick. If you had four independent variables, you could work it out. You'd have 15 different F tests. So for that, 54%, that's pretty high. If you were to consider your experiment successful, if any one of those was less than 0.05, you'd be you know, starting to do that quite quite often. All right, let's do this one more way. And to do that, I'm just going to go to the lab code, which is in here, but you can get this off the website. I guess I could do that too. Uh, let's do that. All right, here I am. I'm going to find our little three factor example. Let's just take that code put it here. And this is an example of a simple data set with three independent variables where we can put numbers in from the normal distribution, simulate the null hypothesis, conduct an ANOVA, calculate p-values. We like to do something like this some 10,000 times. So I want to go back to the conceptual one code. and. I'm going to copy all of this, modify it a little bit for a three-factor situation. So I'm going to grab these things and kind of see what do I need to replace. Okay, we'll copy that out, pop it in there. We're going to save the summary in our output variable, just like before. Now, the only thing that's different now 
is we got to make room for seven p-values. So I think we can take the first seven here. Let's just see if this works. Inside the loop. Let's grab this. And just run it. And okay, there's our seven p-values. That's great. And if we wanted to continue our practice of listing out all of these things, I'm just going to type the names in by hand, a little tedious, but A by C. B by C. And finally, A by B by C. And we've got seven. All right, I'm just going to do this simulation 1,000 times. It's running. It didn't work. What did I do wrong here? One, two, oh, I need a C in here. Great. So I got an error that the columns have to have compatible sizes. So that gave me the clue that I probably messed this up. Okay, let's do this. So we're now running 1,000 different experiments with three independent variables, sampling data from a normal distribution, the same one for all conditions. So this is a null experiment. Um, what would we like to know here? Well, let's ask the question. Um, let's check out what we have in our simulation. What I want to know is how many of the p-values are less than 0.05. So I'm going to use the filter function. And I say p-values less than 0.05. Now if I just do this, we're going to get another data frame where all the p-values are less than 0.05. Oop, oh, I put greater than. Oops, I want to do less than. How about that? All right, here we are. So it looks like in simulation four of those seven, one of them was less than 0.05. In simulation nine, one of them was less than 0.05. In simulation 17, ooh, we got three of them less than 0.05. Okay. I'm interested in the number of experiments that would have made at least one type one error. So I'm going to do a little grouping. I'm going to group by the sim column here. And I'm just going to use the count function. Let's check out what this does. So it's going to go through and count how many rows there are for each simulation where there's a p-value less than 0 0.05. And we saw that the first two, there was only one instance. And in the 17th simulation, there was actually three type 1 errors. So now we have this tibble, and it goes for two. It's 266 rows long. It's just telling us how many type one errors were made uh, for experiments that made type one errors. So we don't see zero in here. It's only if you made a type one error. So it's gonna be one or higher, the number of type one errors. If we use dim, we can see that, uh, whoops, I'm gonna call this type one errors. I'm gonna save that in there. Type one errors. So we can see that that table has uh, 266 rows. And there is 1,000 experiments. So in this case, we had uh, a probability of 26.6% of making a type one error. Um, all right, two ways to run that simulation, and uh, are our results similar? 
we got 30% that time. You know, I'm going to say if we increase the number of simulations to 10,000 and we did all of this again, um, it's going to take a little bit longer, but the estimation of the type 1 error, the family wise type 1 error rate, would be closer to the, the true value. And, you know, we don't need to use our simulation to do this. We're just using this as an excuse to learn some of these R tricks. And let's wait this out. I can press pause and... All right, we're getting closer to 30%, which is what we found with the R binome function. So those are some solutions for these four problems. So you need to pick two. And if you do them all, you'll get some bonus points for the course. That's it. See you next week.